Hey there, welcome to Board Game Hot Takes, a podcast where we give our immediate reactions to the hottest board games just minutes after playing them. My name's Tim. And this is Chris. This is Adam. And today, instead of giving our hot take review on a game we just finished playing, we're going to be talking about our top five games that fall outside of the Board Game Geek top 1,000 games of all time. So these are going to be games that are ranked higher than 1,000 on Board Game Geek that we still think are worth paying attention to, taking a look at. And uh, we're going to jump into that in just a minute. But before we do, you know, every week I ask a poll question or some kind of question on social media, on our Twitter feed at BG underscore hot takes or on our Facebook group, the Board Game Hot Takes Facebook group. And this week I asked a question about thematics in your board game night. And I said, does your game night include music? This question was partially inspired by uh, a, another podcast, Board Game Dojo, asked a question on Twitter a couple of weeks ago asking about this. And I, I responded to it, but it had me thinking a little bit over the last couple of weeks. So I asked our Twitter followers and social media folks what they thought of it. And here was how people responded on social media. Always was 28.9%. Depends on the game, 20.1%. Depends on the players, 20.3%. And never was 30.7%. And never have I been so disappointed and surprised and shocked <laughs> by the people that responded to this poll. How did you guys answer this question? Well, I answered this one, I think depends on the, I don't know, whichever one says depends on the game and the situation. When I think about it truthfully, it's almost always, always, because I do like having some tunes on, something to keep me going, especially if Chris is Aries taking 30 minutes on his turn, I got to have some jams, something to do in the meantime. When I've already thought five moves ahead and I got the whole game planned out, I'm still waiting for Chris to decide if he's going to play a red card or a blue card. I need I need to get down to something. So usually it's some uh, talking heads in the background or some 80s jams or some reggae funk. Um, but yeah, I like some music going on in the background. Nothing distracting, nothing that's going to overpower the game and the fun that I'm having in that moment. But I do like some tunes to keep my brain kind of locked in. So honestly, I'm totally appalled that that many people do not want to have music on their game night. Now, in the reality, I have to say it depends on the group. It depends on the situation. Because, of course, if people are saying, oh, I hate listening to music while I play games, I'm not going to say, oh, no, no, no. You must listen to music when you play games with me. But in reality, do I really want to be playing games with people who don't want to have music on in the background? I'm, I'm saying that jokingly because, of course, I would. I, it's about, you know, hanging out with fun people. But I think it can be a real treat when you have music that's themed to the game. Uh, perfect example, I once played Pan Am with, like, you know, Frank Sinatra playing in the background and drinking to Manhattans. And it was just such a fun time. Or, uh, oh, actually, another good example I was telling you guys about earlier this evening was playing uh, Final Girl. And I had on in the background some like John Carpenter, you know, Halloween music and some really scary stuff. I actually was freaking myself out. The music was so scary. I turned the lights off and everything. And, you know, so music is hugely thematic. I think it's wonderful. And even if it's just playing tunes that are fun, like what Adam was talking about, you got to have music on a game night to truly optimize your play. Oh, you, Tim. Oh, man, I, I can't even imagine being in a room where someone said, no, you have to turn music off this is it's like this it's distracting to me like i just music is just a part of a social experience for me and in fact m one of my favorite memories of playing games ever was with you guys in palm springs we're sitting around the table i want to say it was scythe but we're sitting around and somebody turned on david byrne and i love david byrne and everybody is kind of like bobbing their head and singing to the music and steve's getting annoyed in the background while the three of us are all singing along to it and it's just it just adds like a, an element of just like experience to the game. And I like it when it's like rock or pop music or, you know, just that type of thing. So, yeah, m music is really important to me for any kind of social experience. I don't want to sit there in silence. I feel like it brings the game down. It, it, it brings the whole like mood down. But, you know, part of it, you know, like, listen, if somebody's really bugged by music, I would play a game with them. But it's always playing in the background for me. In fact, my wife got me a record player for Christmas, just as something as kind of a fun little toy. And I've been picking up LPs. And now that's my thing. Like, it's right by my game table. And so now I kind of pick a, a 
I, even when I'm like learning a new game or I'm playing a game solo, which I didn't used to listen to music when I was playing solo, but just because this adds a little fun experience, I'm throwing on some stones or some Beatles or, you know, Fiona Apple or whatever. It's just a great record I've got putting it on in the background. I just, I love music when we're gaming. So for me, it's really important. I would say it's always going to be on while I'm playing board games. It's just part of the social experience for me. You know, just one side thought on the whole thing about records and just why records are so awesome. If you're in a social situation and you're putting on music, one side of an LP is just about the right amount of time for you to be thinking, what do I need to put on next? Do I need to change the mood? Do I need to update? Do I need to keep rolling with the same thing I've got? But that's right about the amount of time you ought to be thinking about that in your head. Yeah, that's a great point, Chris. And in fact, I've been finding, finding myself doing that frequently where I'm, I never have to think like, oh, maybe I should change this up and kind of scratch, you know, like the record scratches in the middle and someone switches and they're like, what are you doing? I, it just, it runs out on its own in 15 minutes and then you, you make a choice to switch it. It's perfect. Here's how some people answered our poll. Uh, so board games and bourbon, this is Glenn Flaherty, who uh, he's also a board game designer, but he said it just depends on how loud and if there are words. Typically, I find dramatic music or lyrics to be distracting, but not always. Glenn, I appreciate that input, but I'm also disappointed as somebody who enjoys board games and bourbon, but doesn't enjoy music. My whole life viewpoint has changed just from that one comment. Ben Green said never for a few reasons. One, there's sleeping children in the house. Two, music just means people raising their voices to talk over it. And three, some of my family members get overstimulated. Okay, overstimulation is an interesting situation. I'm something I luckily don't suffer from and don't have to, to stress about. I'm sure some people do. And that's something you have to be concerned about. As far as raising voices to talk over it, there's a levels you can set music where you, you never have to raise your voice over it and you can still enjoy that background. So set it at the right volume. That's not a problem. Fog Brother said, depending on the group, I may even try to theme up the music. 90s rap for rap gods, etc." but there's always music. Mm. And that's, you know, that's great. And Chris, you're all behind that. You've mentioned that before. Totally agree. Get some thematic music going with the game you're playing. Unlike the Judge Dredd, Martin Wallace game, uh, the Wildlands version, and then Simon and Garfunkel. Yes, that was a bad, bad pairing. Should have done better on that. Mm -hmm. Kieran said, wow, it's so eye-opening reading the responses here. It never occurred to me that you could have a game night without music. For us, it's just second nature. We either put on an album or just shuffle a library Heck, when people come to mind, music is already playing. For me, music is just going to be playing. Yeah, pe music's playing the minute that people are walking in the door and I'm offering them drinks and offering them snacks and we're making some small chat before we get up to start and play the game. And it's going to be playing all night long. And in fact, I've been sitting at a game with Adam where we're dwelling on like a heavy game and the the you know the playlist runs out or the record runs out and Adam's like, Tim, it's why is it so silent in here? Can you fix that? Like. You know, it's sometimes you just forget, but you got to get that music going again. Several people mentioned on this, though, about something I didn't know about this site called Melodice.org. So Melodice.org. And uh, it's it's pretty cool. You go to this site and it just prompts you to enter a board game name. And it's got like kind of a pre-fill list on it. So as you start typing it, it auto fills it. And it will pull up a playlist for you based on the game that you just put in there. I tested a couple. We played Gaia Project tonight before we're recording. And I tried Gaia Project in there. It pulls up a really bunch of cool sci-fi ambient music that works really well. Um, it's got some cool compositions for no matter what game you play. So check that out. If you just want some cool thematic music going on, I'm definitely going to be using this in the future. Although I do like some some good pop or rock going in the background. But if I'm looking for something thematic, I'm, I'm going to this for sure. Let's jump into our feature topic today, which is our top five games that are ranked over 1,000 on Board Game Geek. Now, there's been a lot of discussion. We mentioned it last week about the Board Game Geek ratings. A lot of people say the ratings are nonsense. I'm here to say that they are not nonsense, and there's a lot of value to them. But we'll get to that in a minute. This was Adam's choice, I think. And we and Adam said, let's let's come up with the with some games that are ranked over 1,000 that we should call out. I had an interesting experience making this list. How did you guys feel about this? Did you have a challenge with it? Did you enjoy it? Do you think these games are games that, that we should be calling on our podcast? I think there's a lot of great games outside the top 1,000. So I had fun time making this. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to compile it too easily. And I actually had trouble skimming it down to five. I think there's a, tons of great games. Yeah, tons. There's like a nice amount of games outside the top 
1000 that I enjoy and would be happy to play on a regular basis. Yeah, I agree. I think we forget what ratings actually mean. It doesn't necessarily mean that a game is good or that a game is bad. It just means that in relation to other games that people have rated, it may not have rated as highly. So, you know, theoretically, if you had a thousand great games with minor variations, then you'd rank them all and game number one would be really good and game number a thousand would be really good. So I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with going through the lower end of the list. And as long as there are games that are worth playing, which I think is the whole point of what we're talking about here tonight, is talking about the games that we think are worth talking about and are worth trying, then you know, go for it. Find those games that maybe aren't on everybody's you know, top, of their, top of their mind, but are worth giving a shot to giving a shout out and uh, taking a look at. Yeah, I will say that I do think that, you know, the the ratings, once you're over a thousand, they're just not the best games. There may be some solid games. There may be some decent games out here. But generally, when I'm looking at these games, and I I looked at the way I made this list is I basically looked at every game from a thousand and one to three thousand on Board Game Geek. And so I I didn't go beyond that. There may be some good games that I missed out of there. But I kind of looked at every game in that entire list, the 2,000 games there, and looked through everything that I had played before. Now, admittedly, I have not played every game in this list. I probably played 5% of the games in the 2,000 outside of the top 1,000 list. Does it make any sense? I don't know. I'm throwing a lot of numbers out here. But I probably have only played like 5 out of every 100, maybe maybe 7 to 8 out of every every 100 on this list. So there's a lot of games I haven't played. There's some that I've always been interested in playing. But for some reason, they did not bubble up to the top. And when I look at the games that I have played on this list, the vast majority of them are games that might have been a little bit interesting on a play or two. They might have been pretty cool, but they generally just faded in the in the distance or they weren't fun over many replays. And I, I think there's some reality to that. Like the games that are in the top 100, the ones that I love, are the games that I will go back to hundreds of times and keep going back, you know, keep playing. And so I think for me, I I probably disagree with you guys a little bit on this, but I think the ratings do matter. I think the games that people really do love will bubble up to the top. But I did find a couple gems on this list that I still enjoy going back to. In fact, I found about 15 games in these 2000 games that I would I would say were worth mentioning and five that I think I could talk about with just a couple being really exceptional games that probably belong higher, in my opinion. I do want to jump in back on one thing that you said there, Tim. And I don't necessarily disagree that when you get down past a thousand, you're not talking about the cream of the crop anymore. One of the reasons why I think it does make sense to go down and look at those other games is that they can provide a different experience. I mean, one of the beauties of our hobby these days is that there are so many different experiences out there. There are so many different themes. There's so many different ideas being put into game form that even if the game itself, the mechanisms and you know uh, the production, whatever the thing is that makes it a little bit lower than standard, it can also still be unique and it can be interesting. And like I found on my list, Generally, these were not the games that I want to come back to every day and play over and over again. Because, yeah, those generally are going to be the games that are in the top thousand or even the top 100. But there's a whole bunch of games in there that are fun experiences that I do want to come back to because they offer something a little bit different from what I'm playing every day. And I, and I think that makes it I think that makes it a worthy list. Yeah, well, there are there are definitely a lot of unique games when you once you get up that this high. I'm going to start off this list, and the way I ranked mine, I didn't necessarily go by the actual rating number. I just kind of picked out of the top five that I thought were worth talking about. I picked my least favorite to my favorite of these top five. But again, all five of them are games that I thought were pretty fun to play, pretty interesting, and maybe deserve to be a little bit higher on the list. The first one I'm going to mention is Kabuto Sumo, and this was designed by Tony Miller. This was published by BoardGameTables.com, and it's sitting all the way down at 2146 at this point and i just think this is a really interesting game it's a dexterity game where you've got a little platform and you're taking turns using a a piece of wood to kind of push these discs around the board and see where they fall off and knock the other players discs off the board um it, it they just i think board game tables did a good job of taking this game putting a clever theme on it Quan Shai Morii did the artwork which you know provides a little fun flavor to the game and uh, the couple times I played it, I had a good time with it. And I actually just recently bought this for 
our friend Jen's son for Christmas and uh, got a chance to help them open it up and and set it up and learn the game again. And it's just a game that brought me some satisfaction and happiness with the whole experience. I think it's very unique for what it does. I think taking that coin pushing mechanism and turning it into a board game and putting a fun theme on it is something that I think is worth calling out. I think it probably deserves to be a little bit higher for at least the unique experience it brings. Yeah, Tim, it's a good call out here. Kabuto Sumo, what a fun game. What a neat idea. The little quarter pushing game turned into a board game with these unique insects. They're all crazy looking, these different powers, these different little claws or giant circle or some weird shaped little dung beetle with its little poop trying to push people off. It's a fun, clever, interesting game. And a perfect example of what I was saying a minute ago, which is this game may not be the one you want to come back to every game night. It may be one that you never want to pull out for a, <laughs> a big game night. But what an interesting idea. What a fun thing. And the whole bug sumo, I mean, that's just, I'm fascinated. The first game I want to talk about here is Sentient. And I've talked about this one before on the show. This one's currently ranked at... Uh, 1227 designed by j alex cavern released in 2017 i'm gonna call it the artist here because i think the art is beautiful chris ostrowski and gordon tucker are the artists credited for sentient this game's fascinating sci-fi theme all these robots all these droids that's totally pasted on aside from me really loving this kind of world that's built it has nothing to do with the game what you do you start off rolling these five dice and you place this uh, these dice on your player board spread them out and you're going to bid on these different cards using your workers so at the end of the round you're going to collect the card and you put them on your board and actually just buy them right away you put them on a board and they have in the top left and right of each card is something that's going to manipulate those dice it's going to either decrease the value or increase the value and the card has a condition on it like the left dice has to be two less than the right dice. Uh, and if that all matches up, then you're good to do or you're going to score some points. Some unique mechanisms, a little bit of set collection, an interesting tiebreaker and player order mechanism involved here. Interesting auction going on here. A lot of stuff going on here, but in a small, tight little package, it all makes sense once you go through it once or twice. The rules teach is super easy. But the the depth of strategy and the thinking here far surpasses the shortness of the rules. So this is one I love. I want to bring this one out to Sedona with us and uh, introduce you guys to it. It's, you know, it's nothing cosmic, but it's a fun game. I think you guys might enjoy this one. How's that for an endorsement? You guys might or might not like it. (laughs) That's sentient. Well, I remember you talking about this one and I was looking at the art for it and what a what a beautiful set of art this game has. I just want to look at it. I'm not sure if I want to play it or not, but I know I want to look at it. <laughs> All right. Well, my number five game, and I did mine a little bit differently than say what Tim did, and I didn't rank these. I just took them in the order that they appeared in the list, starting at the lowest ranked game on my list, going up to the highest ranked game. And interestingly, my list went all the way from my first game, which is down around 16,000, believe it or not, all the way up to just under, just over a 1,000. So a pretty wide swing there. So my first game that I wanted to talk about, coming in at number 15,783 on the BGG list, is La Corsa, designed by Mark Haskins and published by Linnea Rossa Games. This is one that I got from a friend shortly after introducing them to board gaming, and they fell pretty hard for board games and were out looking for things that, you know, caught their eye. And he bought me this game. And it's actually quite delightful for a light kind of um, low rules overhead, relatively simple game. It's themed after IndyCar racing or Formula One racing. And the production of this thing is actually pretty amazing for for something this simple it's got the track which is a small piece of wood which folds out and into little basically spaces but there's only like 10 spaces on it there are these eight or so chunky little plastic formula one cars which look so cool and so retro and then a really nice set of cards that have they're numbered cards for the most part but they have really interesting really abstract Uh, designs on them. 
So very simple in production, but very, very classy, very, very nice to put your hands on and to look at. And really, it's the simplest idea. Basically, you start with cars lined up one, two, three, four, like you would in a race. And the first thing you do is you auction, basically, by using your cards to decide who's going to start in which position on the track. And then each person will take their own individual stack of cards, which each have essentially the same numbers. And the higher the number, the more points you get when doing comparisons, of course, like, you know, like in most games. So each turn, you're going to be either moving up the track or you're going to be jockeying for position with other players in the track. And a round is essentially each player choosing who they want to go up against, whether who they want to move up uh, the person in front of them or do they want how do they want to proceed? And then those two players throwing down cards and trying to bluff the other one, trying to you know find some way to get in front of the other player. And eventually, after the cards run out, whoever is in the front position is the winner of that round. And you can play it in multiple rounds. You can actually play it in teams. Uh, and again, it's a five minute teach, relatively simple game, very simple game, and and a lot of fun. And it's quick. And that's uh, I think there's a market for that in my world, having a game that's both fun to play and quick to teach and quick to play. And I think this one deserves a spot a little bit higher on the list than 15,000, honestly. Chris, what's this one called? I can't even find it. La Corsa. And I believe it's got a colon in there, which I didn't mention because I want to say nice things about the game. It's called like a, a Grand Prix game or something like that. Okay. Oh, I thought, I thought you meant like La colon Corsa. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. La, La Corsa is the name of the game, which I believe is Italian for the race. It's really interesting. So this is rated up around, like ranked up around 15,000 and uh, you enjoyed it. But it is interesting. Like, why did this end up at 15,000? Did it just not get any marketing to it? Is it just too old for people in you know board game geek world to recognize it? I, I think it's kind of interesting why some of these games fall. Are they just not as good as games in the top five hundred, or are they did they just get missed? And maybe there's some you know there's some uh, explanation there. Um, I'm going to keep going into my list here and explain why I don't think that's the case. I think some of these games just aren't quite as good, but uh, not sure about 15,000. The next game on my list is a game called Asara. And this is the this was designed by Michael Kiesling and Wolfgang Kramer, which are some pretty famous board game designers. This was published by Ravensburger back in 2010. This is a uh, kind of an earlier worker placement game, but it the unique concept of it is that instead of playing workers, you have a hand of cards. And there's a bunch of worker placement regions. The whole goal of this game is to build up towers. And the taller the towers you build, the more points you get. You build towers of different colors. So the different worker placement spaces mostly are about going out to spaces and trying to get sections of towers, whether it's a base or middle sections or tops or whatever. And so if you can kind of get the right sections and build the tallest towers of these sections, you're going to get more points for them when you construct them. Um, So when you go to one of these workers placement regions, there might be four or five spots open you can go to and you would place a card there if you're the first person. But your cards are just different colors. I don't know what they represent people of some kind or statues or something like that. But let's say I play a purple card there. Well, if Adam then wants to also use that space to pick up another similar region, he would also have to play a purple card. So the re- the worker placement restriction is not that you get blocked if somebody else goes there first, but that you have to kind of follow with the same color. And so you're playing a little bit of a game of like, hey, I've got a bunch of purples. I would think that that means that it's less likely that Chris has purples in his hand. So I'm going to lead with that. Or I'm going to hold back a bunch of different colors to make sure that I have colors I can place in other places on the board. Uh, this is a really clever game. And um, so something that the first time I played it, I was just blown away. And the second time I was like, wow, this this game is so cool. But I think this is one of the greatest examples for me of why games over the top thousand have stayed there. This is actually sitting at 1,354 overall. And it's the fact that about the third or fourth game I played it, and this was a game that I absolutely loved at first, I was like, this is becoming routine. There's a cycle you go through. You need to do the same things. You need to go after the same things. And there, there's no more discovery in the game. And that's not true of games that I absolutely love that are sitting up in the top 100 or 200, where I feel like every game is a new discovery. It's a new puzzle to enjoy. Um, and so I think that that's why, again, I lean towards the games that are up at this point in the Board Game Geek ratings. 
they're not bad games. They can be interesting games, but they may just not have the staying power to keep people excited, keep people interested. And in fact, I looked at my own rating on this from several years ago when I played it, and I've got it rated a seven. And I think it's a perfectly good seven. Seven's not bad, but seven doesn't deserve to be in the top thousand games of Board Game Geek. So that's Asara. It's a great game. Check it out if you have a chance to play it. You might have a few really fun plays out of it. So Timmy said you got about how many plays out of this? Yeah, it was about three or four when I said when it went from a game that I was like, this game just blew my mind and I loved what it was doing to this game is starting to feel rote and kind of the same decisions and 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 not very interesting anymore. Next up on my list is a game I've talked about before is Trekking the World. This is designed by Charlie Bink, came out in 2020, currently sitting at 1440 on board game geek in this game you are a little traveler and you're going around the world just like it says you have these cards up at the top that you're trying to go for different destinations and each of these destinations costs a different amount of different color cards these destinations are actual real places there's a whole big description on them on the back of each one of these there's these giant beautiful cards if you haven't seen the art on this go take a look in the process of buying these locations you are visiting different parts of the world, picking up these cubes and a little set collection mechanic. It's two-way set collection, so you can collect the row or you can collect the column. Both give you little boosters and little points. There's a region um, collection. If you get all this stuff in a region, then you get the little bonus points off of that. So it's relatively simple. Again, easy to pick up. Uh, you're deciding the best way to do these routes, and then the game changes up with these different, I think they're called journal cards, some little magical powers you can elect to spend your cards on rather than um, discarding them for movement or for buying that location. So multi-use cards, a bunch of stuff to do. Again, you know what, Tim, like you were saying, this one isn't going to blow you away, but this is a good intro game. I think a game that anybody can pick up plays relatively quickly and it's fun. I think it's a lot of fun and just enough there to mix it up to keep it interesting. That is Trekking the World. Honestly, Adam, that's one that I'm shocked it was that low on the list. I know it's it's a very fun game. I've played it and really enjoyed it. But I also know it's a very popular, well-regarded game. So I was a little surprised to hear that it's that far down the list. Now, this was a game that we actually featured on an episode way back in episode 25. And I remember saying at the time, and I've actually played it a few times since then, that this was kind of the ticket to ride killer for me because it has a similar mechanism of just like collecting cards until you have a set to build. But I found the interactions a lot more fun and some little Euro style mechanisms of trying to collect sets of of, uh, souvenirs, souvenirs, Mm -hmm. yeah, that you're collecting to kind of get ahead of other people in set collection. I think this is a great game for what style it is. So why did Ticket to Ride do so much better why is it sitting in the top 200 while trekking the world is not got there earlier maybe similar to similar style game adam have you heard of uh there's i think it's called trekking through time but it's like the newest iteration of this that has kind of a time travel mode mechanism yeah i don't think it's i don't know if it's trekking through time or trekking through history i think it might be trekking through history that looks Mm -hmm. really good i've heard some good things about it i haven't tried it yet But I love to. I know Trekking the World is on Board Game Arena, so maybe Trekking Through History Mm -hmm. will be coming up soon. Yeah, interesting. I I thought Trekking Through History sounded fun, too, where you got kind of explored different historical events and some just locations in the world. But yeah, Trekking the World for a family weight game, super fun. Um, Yeah, probably deserves to be a little higher than it is. So uh, again, interesting topic as to why it's not. So my number four game is coming in at number 7,263 on the BGG list. And this is another one that I honestly cannot believe is rated as low as it is. And it's one of the few games on my list this week that we have actually talked about quite a bit. In fact, we did an episode on this game. And it's Rap Gods by Omari Akil and published by Colorway Game Labs. I had so much fun with this game. In fact, to this day... It's one of those games that more than almost any other that we've played, I'm like, oh, I really want to play that again. And it just doesn't seem to come around. But a super fun game, thematically wonderful. I love the feel of it. It's it's a unique game. Uh, The production is awesome. The, The board is set up like a giant record, a giant LP, bringing it back to, you know, Tim's uh, recent fascination with record players. Uh, 
And the art on this thing is hilarious. The art and the, and the sense of humor. I think that's probably one of the things I remember most about this game was having such a good time, not only because it had good mechanisms, but because the sense of humor, I was laughing with every card and had such a good time. So perfect example of I'm not sure, I'm not sure why, but I think this is a game that clearly deserves to be higher on the list than it is. And that, that just kind of makes me scratch my head. This is a great call out. Now, I, I do cu- curious on this one if the reason why it's not ranked higher is that just more people never got a chance to play it. This was a Kickstarter game. It got delivered to backers, and I don't know that it's ever been reprinted or available to people. Again, I've never seen it in stores. I've never seen it on online uh, places. When we reviewed this, in fact, which was back in episode 42, we reached out to the designer at the time. They said they were talking about doing another Kickstarter, but I don't think they've ever done or at least delivered on that uh, subsequent Kickstarter that they did for hoop gods so that might just be a lack of the mm-hmm. ability to play it and that does impact ratings it's you know to some extent so it's an interesting call out it's also funny that one of the people that responded to our poll at the beginning of this episode actually called out rap gods i yeah, know so funny <laughs> yeah and actually that's a good i'm glad you brought that up because i did go back and look at the colorway game labs website a few times since we played this and i don't believe i ever have seen it in stock it might have been like a pre-order or that sort of thing, but I never did go on there and see it available for purchase right away. Yeah, Chris is a great call and a great game. Rap Gods here. I want to call it the art. You talked about a little bit, but the art here is beautiful. It features a lot of, I don't know, street art, graffiti, and it's the style of art here. It's fantastic. Um, it's all on the cards. It's on the board itself. It's it's everywhere, and it's just a joy to look out. What a fun game, Rap Gods. So my next, uh, my number three is Terracotta Army. And this is a game actually that we just reviewed a few months ago. It was episode 121. And I'm surprised this isn't higher. It's sitting at 2082 right now. Now, it's a fairly new game and it could end up rising. But I suspect based on the fact that I'm not hearing a lot of people talk about it and it's sitting here now, you know, I think it's going to be kind of lost to time. And I think that's a shame because this is one example where I think Terracotta Army deserves to be higher. Everything I heard about it, that, that I had heard got me excited to play it was pretty positive. We had some pretty positive things to say. It's one of these games that has been in my mind. I want to go back and play it some more. So I think it's a strong game. I'm not sure why it didn't didn't just spark for more people or, or kind of hit for more people. I think this was published by Board and Dice, which you know puts out a lot of the T games, a lot of very popular Euro games. And uh, this one had a really cool production, some unique things going on. So I think Terracotta Army deserves to be higher than 2082. It probably will get up a little bit higher. It's it's worth checking out. It's worth playing. This is one I had to book out before I could play it with you guys. But I remember seeing, it seemed like points were just getting handed out left and right, especially that in-game scoring where these different, uh, I don't know, seemed a little complex. Maybe once you played it a few times, it would come right along nice and smooth. But points for this guy, pointing his arrow at this dude and this horse, looking at this guy with this column and this row. Mm -hmm. It just seemed a little bit strange, that in-game score to me. But this is one I'd like to try again and get the full feel. My number three game is the Expanse board game. And this has been some of my most fun gaming experiences playing this game. I played it online with a group, and then we played it at Palm Springs when we all got together at one time. This is done by Jeff Engelstein, and the publisher here is Wiz Kids Games, and I think it suffers. It suffers from the the publishing a little bit. The cards are all kind of dark and dim, and you have these little tiny chits for ships, and you just have cubes. They did release an expansion with a brighter, more vibrant board and a couple little modules that help it out. But I love the intellectual property here, The Expanse, the TV shows on Amazon. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. If you love sci-fi, it's fantastic. Not even just sci-fi. If you want to see a class disparity uh, represented in space, and it's just an analogy for what's happening all over the globe at the moment. Great show, well-written. And that comes through here in the game. Well, not really. It's a fun game. So yeah, it's kind of a la Twilight Struggle, it's a card-driven game. There's a market that shuffles along. You're paying victory points to buy some of these cards, and you can elect to keep them or play them now. And then every time I try to explain this, I sound like a complete moron. <laughs> there's, a, uh, there's an event associated with each of these cards, and if you don't do the event, the factions 
that are eligible for the events get priority order to do that event. So multi-use cards again, and one of those uses is the event that I just talked about. The other use, you can use it for points to do cool stuff. Put out your ships, put out your influence, move stuff around. There's a dynamic scoring every once in a while. These scoring cards are going to come up. And then if you're in a position to buy one, you snatch it up. And that triggers a whole series of events um, before the scoring actually happens. The Rasanante is involved and the whole crew of the Rasanante is in there getting up to mischief and helping you out. Switching factions the whole game. Very thematic. I absolutely love this game. Some of the most fun experiences, like I said, have been had playing this game despite its production. That's the Expanse board game. Well, Adam, you speak the truth that this game deserves better in a lot of ways because the gameplay is fun, the IP is amazing, and there is nothing but shame in making cards that are just crappy screen captures from a television show. That is yeah. that is so sad. Yeah, I think this is a perfect example where this game would be higher. I think it would have gotten more attention. And, and maybe it's that it's not a super popular IP, right? This isn't Star Wars or Star Trek or Dune. Um, and so maybe it wouldn't have been higher because of that. I looked at my own rating on this, and I have really, really fond memories of playing this game. And I've got it rated a 7. But I think it's rated a 7 because of the production. Uh, I think the gameplay is fantastic. It's exactly that streamlined 4X game that I want out of ARCs that I'm excited about. And I, I think it's there. I think this is a great game. If this got a redo, probably never will. But if it did, if it got a like a, a you know deluxe edition or a deluxe production on this, I think this game would go a lot further than it was. So that's a shame. Yeah. So my number three game is the one game that on my list that I haven't actually played. This is one that I would like to try, or at least... I think I would like to try for, I'll explain more about that in a minute, but it comes in at number 5,304. So we haven't even cracked, barely cracked 5,000 here on my list. So we are still way, 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 way down there. And this one is almost a hundred percent pure nostalgia for me. And this game is Mule, the board game by Heiki Harju and published by Laudapellet.fi or Fi or Fee, who knows? But this game is based on an IP that I'm guessing a lot of people who are listening to this podcast are not old enough to even know what I'm talking about. Do you guys have either of you guys heard of Mule before? No, this is totally new to me. I've I've seen this, like Mule with the abbreviations after each yes. letter, but I have no idea what to tell me about it, Chris. What's going on here? Mule, or multi-use labor element, it's based on a 1983 video game by a brand new publishing company called Electronic Arts, which some of you may have actually heard of. It was one of their first five games. And actually, I got the list here because I was so fascinated at the history of this whole thing, which also included Axis Assassin, Archon, The Light in the Dark, Worms, with a question mark, and Hard Hat Mac, all of which I played in the early 80s along with <laughs> Mule and had so much fun. In fact, just let me take a trip down memory lane for like two seconds here. Archon, The Light in the Dark, was one of the most fun games I ever played back on my Commodore 64 days. It was like a chess game, except when you moved into a space, you actually had to have a battle between two characters to who was going to keep that space. And there was different levels of strength, kind of like in a you know chess pieces. But uh, so much fun, so many great memories. But the interesting thing is that Mule, the video game, was often compared to basically like a board game. And maybe it was ahead of its time, because this is 1983. We're not talking, this is way before we actually had games like Catan. But this game actually has a lot of similarities with something like that. In fact, uh, one might argue that people, the people who published or developed Catan might have been inspired by the game Mule. You're essentially working around a map, and in the map you have different types of regions which produce different types of resources, and you have to have food, you have to have energy, you have to have ore to make your mules, which are your labor that you that, that does all the uh, the mining for you or the production for you, and then this this mineral called cristite, which is basically like the the gems and the riches. And there's a lot of 
picking your spaces, deciding what you want to try to produce there. So if you're in the mountains, then you can produce more ore. But if you're in the plains, you can produce more food, that sort of thing. And then you're trading, you're buying and selling, you're auctioning off the goods that you have that are extra. And frankly, when I looked at this game and actually saw a little bit about how it plays and what it looks like, it's a little bit lackluster. I think a lot. I think a lot of this is really just that I, I have such great memories of playing the video game. But I think it would be a lot of fun to try it. Whether it'd be fun to play it a second time, I can't quite say. But just having Mule come back into my radar in a 2015 board game was enough to make me say I really want to give this one a shot, even if it is sitting at 5,300 on the BGG hot list. Chris, I can see why you would say the production looks a little lackluster here, but the artwork looks pretty charming on the the box cover and some of the cards. Is that right from the video game or is there some sort of, you know, comic book associated? What's going on here? It's actually, they changed it up a little bit from the, the, uh, the video game. In fact, the video game I thought was kind of even more adorable. These mules are, they're supposed to be these kind of thrown together things that you do your work for you and they look sort of like mules except they're made of like pots and pans and leftover electronics and things like that the ones that they show on the the board game box here look a little bit like they were actually purpose built uh which is kind of against the spirit of (laughs) the sort of thrown together (laughs) mules in the video game but it is cute it is a lot of fun to look at and i think that part of it would be would be a treat we can track this thing down and get it played, man. I know, I know. Very interesting, Chris. Thanks for an introduction to something I'd never heard of the video game or the board game before. So my number two game is uh, by one of the most famous board game designers of all time, and it's sitting all the way at number 1093. And this is the Castles of Tuscany. This is Stefan Feld's game from just a couple of years ago, the follow-up to the, his most famous game, The Castles of Burgundy. And I think this is just a shame that it's sitting down at 1093. This game deserves to be a lot higher. Um, It is a very fun, slightly lighter version of a tile laying game that's similar to Castle Burgundy. It has some similar scoring mechanisms where you're trying to complete regions uh, to get extra bonuses and some other opportunities to get bonuses in the game. Um, a game it uses a simpler action selection mechanism instead of rolling dice you're you, you're drawing hands of cards and once you have sets of cards you can turn them in to place tiles but i've had so much fun playing this game every single time i played it and i think it is uh, i think the only reason it's as low as it is is because it gets compared to so many other great Stefan Feld games and people just can't comprehend that much awesomeness from one designer <laughs> so they start <laughs> dropping them lower and lower because they just don't compare to other games for those people. I will say that I heard a lot of early reviews when this came out, because of course people were excited about the follow-up to Castle of Burgundy, and almost every review I ever heard was wrong. They missed the point with this game. There's a lot of complaints about the scoring, how you felt like there was um, you know, the way that the the first round scoring, you can't catch up if you, somebody does well blah, blah, blah. It's actually very similar to Castle Burgundy scoring, where if you can get a set out early, you get more points early in the game. Same thing happens here. The earlier you can get sets out, uh, the more they're going to multiply over the course of the game and have some more points for them. And there is opportunities to catch up to people that are ahead. It, it's just a super fun game. The only complaint I have about it is that there are so many components. The setup and teardown is a little bit long for what the game is, but I love this game. I I will go back and play it anytime, and I think it is underrated for a Steffenfeld game and for a great Euro game in general. So I do not sit on the cast of Tuscany. Uh, it's worth checking out. This is one I haven't tried, and I know your enthusiasm for Feld sometimes glosses over me, but I would like to give this one a try. It looks super. Do you own this one or who? Jen does. So I, I bought it for for Christmas, I think, last year. And so we've played it quite uh, quite a bit. Um, and we always have fun with it. I I don't think I've ever won it. I'm like, I'm terrible at this game because I love just going after these different little bonuses and sets. And, and that's the type of year I love where there's, there's so many things that just drive me to fun decisions that I forget about the end game scoring. But it's a super fun game. I played played lots of games of it. Up next for me, as I'm approaching Chris's number and we're moving in opposite directions, is Age of Galaxy. And this is another one I talked about before. This is sitting at 3,642 on Board Game Geek. And this is an explosive 4X 
basically, yeah, 4X game in a little tiny, teeny tiny box is basically a card game. You're using these multi-use, it's not basically a card game. There's cards involved. There's these multi-use cards. You're playing some of these out there to get your engine going. And you're also researching technologies and exploring the galaxy in front of you, colonizing planets, doing this, doing that, all of this to get your engine going. There's a little battle phase at the end of each round two, where it's basically an auction mechanism and you get to gain control of some more planets and this and that. It all ties together incredibly nicely, again, in a teeny tiny but impactful production, I think. This game was fantastic. It blew me away. I was not expecting anything. Um, I've had some other Kickstarters in small boxes that were just disappointing. Uh, I'm looking at you, Valhalla Llamas. <laughs> but this one here, it blew my mind, and it was a fantastic game. I think you guys enjoyed it, too. That's Age of Galaxy, designed by Jeffrey CCH and published by Ice Makes Games. I still can't get over the name Age of Galaxy. Which means absolutely nothing. <laughs> it was a fun game, though. I, I will admit that. I didn't love it as much in the first play, but playing it in real life and playing it a second time, it started to grow on me a bit. Yeah, this game deserves to be higher. I I can't believe it's sitting way down at 36.42. It's rated at a 7.8 as well, which is something you would find in the top 100. But of course, it needs a lot more ratings to get there. And, uh, you know, who knows? I, I think when we talked about this on our episode, I think like 15 people I know or listeners bought this game. So we probably single-handedly moved it from like the 5,000s to the 3,600s. Uh, but go check out this game. It is inexpensive. You can buy it on Amazon right now for like $29.99. Um, and it's it's a great, it's a tiny little box, but it's a huge epic game in it. And I've had a blast a couple times we played it. I can't wait to play it some more. So my number two comes in at 2,694 on BGG's hot list. And this is one that I, once again, can't quite figure out why this one is as low as it is. I'm guessing in this case, it's probably because this is a relatively family weight game. It's a puzzly little, puzzly little game called Tiki Topple by Keith Myers and published by Game Right. And I actually got this one because my son got it for his birthday or Christmas, I think a few years ago, but it is actually a clever little game. It's it's family weight, but it is clever enough that someone who enjoys gaming could actually have fun with this, playing it either as a, you know, a palate cleanser or playing it with their kids. I think we actually played it at a game night one time, Tim, when you and I first started playing and we, we busted it out to play between two of the heavier games that we were playing. And it, super simple, very quick and easy. You've got this board with a bunch of little tiki's on them lined up in uh, from top to bottom, one on top of the other. And then each player has a deck of cards and they play their cards and the cards let them do uh, some kind of movement within the the order of the tiki. So you can move one up or you can move one down or you can move one from a spot all the way to the bottom or all the way up to the top. And ultimately what you're trying to do in each round is to get the tiki's in the right order to match cards that you have that are goals. And there's a little bit more to it than that, but that's the basic gist of the game. So it's very much a puzzly little game and it's very quick to play. It's super fun. And I think one of the things that really made this one stand out to me is the absolutely amazing production that this thing has for the simple little game that it is. It's got this great two-layer board where you put the tiki. There's like a little slot cut out in the middle where they slide right in and, and move up and down very satisfyingly. The tiki's themselves are these great wooden pieces. They're polished. They're colorful. They have... Um, fun little designs on them, super fun to play with. This is a game that I just, I like to take out and touch. It just feels so good. And if you have kids, a great one to play with kids, a great introduction to gaming, super fun. It's sitting down there just about uh, 2,600. So uh, maybe we'll give it a little bit of a boost in the episode tonight. I think there is some element to board game geek users that are going to rate 
heavier games a little bit higher. And I think this is a well-known phenomenon. Yeah. Now, Tiki Topple is weighted at 1.3 on Board Game Geek. And of course, there are some some lighter games. Think of games like Azul that are rated quite a bit higher, but it's rare you see this type of game. Interestingly, Chris, you and I played this together probably five years ago, and Mm -hmm. I don't remember too much about it, although I do remember having a pretty fun time when we were playing it. But I, I have a rating of six on it. Hmm. which isn't isn't bad but it's it's not something i'm going to be driving to go back to and the board game geek rating on it is 6.5 which is you know partly what what brings it down here in the 2000s so th- i think this is a great fit for a game that's a little bit over a thousand right it's a fun enough game but um but you know not super memorable for me i think you got a little bit of a uh you know a hobby link to it, which probably drives a little bit hard, higher for you as well. But again, that that's probably true. Decently fun game, and uh, I had a good time. With it. Get get Tim's poo poo attitude out of here. I am <laughs> looking at this game on board. I can't stop smiling looking at this thing, Chris. It looks absolutely gorgeous. These amazing tiki's you were talking about. There's that channel in the middle where these things are going to slide up and down. I want to get this game right now, and I want to play it. What's the youngest you would uh, go down to for a kid playing this one? BGG says 10 and up, uh, and it says on here the community rates it as 6 and up. I'd probably tend to go with the community on this one. I think this is one you could easily play with a, a 5, 6, 7, 8-year-old. I mean, my son, every once in a while, he's 11 now and asked to pull this one out because it's a quick, fun little game. And again, a part of the fun is just touching it and feeling it and looking at it. This is It's just a fun it's just a fun little experience, more, probably more so than with, with kids than with hardcore gamers. But, you know, sometimes that's what you need. You need a fun little game to play with the kids. That's exactly correct. One other game that we talked about on our podcast, and this was way back in episode 16, was my favorite roll and write game that exists. And it's one of the earlier roll and write games of the modern era that I had a chance to play and I fell in love with it and I haven't found anything else that quite gives me the experience that I got from this. And this is Rajas of the Ganges, the Dice Charmers. This is the Inca and Marka brand follow-up to their board game, which is also a game that I love. But this roll and write game has continued to provide fun. It's one of the only games with paper stacks that I've almost run out of because we played it so many times and continue to have fun playing it. So if you like Roland Wrights, got to check out Rajas the Ganges, the Dice Charmers. It is a weird, dense rule book that it, it, the game is not as complicated to learn as the rule book makes it out to be. So maybe watch a how to play video or something. I can teach this game in like five to 10 minutes right now. And people are just in and playing it and having a blast with it. But the rule book uh, feels complicated when, when you look at it. So that may be a turnoff for some people. This is sitting at 1,027, just outside of the top 1,000. It's sitting at a 7.6 rating on Board Game Geek. One other thing that I think may have hurt this a little bit, I remember after playing it and kind of looking up some reviews on it, and the Dice Tower, which is a very popular review channel, Tom Vassell did a rating on this, a a review on it, and what he said when he reviewed it was, why would I play this instead of just the original Rajas of the Ganges? They are very different games. They use the same iconography. They use some related mechanisms but they play nothing alike i think it was one of the worst reviews i've ever seen from somebody comparing one game to another um if you like the style of rajas of ganges check this out you know the 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 colorful uh you know ancient indian kind of artwork and style and look and feel check this out it's very fun uh production if you like a a, a roll and write game that's just full of combos check this out this is the game on my list that deserves to be much, much higher. And in my case, would be top 100 for sure. Rajas of Ganges of Dice Charmer is just a fantastic roll and write game that continues to bring fun for me. Okay, my number one game, I guess, I don't know if it's number one or how you want to say it, but the, I guess, is the highest ranked game that I'm talking about tonight is 2,334 overall. This is Capital X2, Generations. Released in 2020, art by Quanche Mori. I just talked about it not too long ago. I think in the last episode or two episodes ago. Elif Svensson, Christian Amundsen, Ostby. A great little card game. I don't want to spend too much time talking about it since I just touched on it at the end of one of the the last episodes we did. You're 
Yeah, you're playing cards in a clever way. You can manipulate the stuff that the people have to beat on the other stuff with a thing to do this, to do that thing. You grab the thing, and now they're screwed, and you win, and you get the points. It's a fun game. It's clever, and it plays quickly. Light rules overhead. Amazing, thoughtful, clever, tricky stuff going on here. Capital X2 Generations. Sitting at 2,334, a fantastic game outside of the Board Game Geek Top 1,000. Well, since I I know Chris doesn't want to say anything at all about this game, I'll just mention that we did cover it in episode 15, and I'm shocked by how many games we actually featured on this show that are outside of the Board Game Geek Top 1,000. We should be ashamed of ourselves, (laughs) and I'm sorry, listeners, for putting you all through that. And... I can't believe how many times Capital Lux 2 Electric Boogaloo has come up on our show. (laughs) Not enough. All right. Well, now, that gets me to my number one. And this is a travesty. This one, I can... like. So the others, I'm kind of like, oh, yeah, no, this one shouldn't be in at number 20,000. This one should be much higher than that. But this is one where I'm like, I am appalled that this game is as low as it is It's number 1,056 on the BGG ratings, and it is Batman Gotham City Chronicles (laughs) by Frederick Henry. Appalling. Appalling. It's appalling, I tell you, (laughs) by uh, Frederick Henry and published by Monolith Games. And I've said it before. I will say it again. This game, well, for one, it's a great game. I think it's got a lot of complexity. That's probably what it suffers a little bit from that. It is probably one of the finest bits of fan service you will ever find in board gaming for comic book fans. This has got every detail of Batman down to, in every character, down to the smallest nth degree personality quirks and willingness to use a deadly weapon or not. And it's a beautiful production. Um, I've joked before that I've got like 10 boxes of this sitting in my game room, you know, taking up a whole lot of space that I can't play because I don't have anybody to play it with until the season three comes out, which I'm waiting on now from Kickstarter, where they're giving you the solo mode, which I think will be wonderful. But seriously, this is an amazing game. I can only imagine that it's the complexity and the bad rule book. It does suffer from a bad rule book, which I understand will be made much better by a Paul Grogan rewrite in the new edition. And yeah, so the complexity is the only thing I can really point to other than the bad rule book that makes this game, I don't know, not in the top 100. I'm I'm just shocked by that. Well, I had the pleasure of playing this with Chris several times, but I also had the joy of trying to learn this game. And I think the reason this game is ranked lower than it should be is because of the inaccessibility of what Chris is calling a bad rule book is an abhorrent (laughs) disaster of a rule book that makes the game unlearnable. (laughs) That's fair. um, This game, I actually, I rated this a six out of 10 on board game geek and I had a fairly fun time playing it, but that was after spending like four plus hours with Chris struggling through trying to learn how to play this game and it deserves a ping for that. So hopefully the next version does introduce a better rule book. And if this gets out to more people and is more accessible through that rule book and that experience, then kudos. And I, I hope a lot more people get a chance to play because it does have some really, really cool stuff going on. So I, I admit that it's, it's a, it's a rad game. That's what I was going to ask. How's the actual gameplay? Is it pretty, yeah. you know, is it, how's it compared to something like Nemesis? Is it a co-op? Is it uh what do you do? Why, what makes it cool? It's a one versus one or one versus many game where one person plays the villain and then a team of people or one person playing as a team gets to play the good guys. And it's so cool because the bad guys, which I played every time, has this really interesting action selection mechanism, a dashboard. So you play in a scenario and there's good guys and bad guys laid out around the scenario in different places and the figures are determined by the scenario. But my little dashboard has a row of different character cards. So if I play one, then it moves to the back of the row and it would cost me more expensive to use again. So kind of a clever mechanism there. And then the good guys have their own, each individual character has its own little dashboard that has this cool action selection uh, mechanism, different equipment. It's just very cool, very thematic. Everything about it works really well, except for the 
the the terrible amount of iconography you have to struggle through for very minor differences in abilities and things like that. But yeah, the gameplay was fit, was really, really fun, really cool. Okay. Did we lose Chris? No, I'm still here. You described that so nicely. I didn't have anything to add. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, no, that was great. So before we wrap up today, let's just talk about a couple uh, other honorable mentions or games that you've ran across as you're running through this these games over the top 1,000 you think are worth mentioning. Just a couple I wanted to call out. One is Lacrimosa, which is right outside the top 1,000. Oh, yeah. But the reason I didn't call it out, and I think it definitely deserves to be higher than 1,000, is just because I think it's going to get there really soon. It's a new game. It's right on the fringe. Yeah. And I think it's going to be up in the top couple hundred uh, soon. I think it deserves to be there. Uh, a couple more that I want to call out really quickly. Super Skill Pinball 4K is a really fun roll and write by Jeff Engelstein, which represents uh, basically playing a, a you know a typical pinball machine, and it works so well. It feels so thematic. I had a great time with it. The only reason I wouldn't say it deserves to be higher is because it's pretty much a solo experience. It doesn't feel like a very great multiplayer experience, and so I, I suspect it's, it struggles from that a little bit. Um, and then Mariposas was a shockingly fun mm-hmm. game for me, which I've only played once, um, but it's sitting outside of a thousand. Uh, would like to get back to it and see if it holds up a little bit. Maybe it's one of those games that doesn't hold up well, but it's beautiful and really interesting experience. Guillotine was a light card game that was one of my earliest introductions to hobby board games, a uh, early Wizards of the Coast published game, a uh, fun little light game about the French Revolution. Um, always enjoyed that one. And then the Artemis Project, which is a more recent Euro style game with a cool theme on it that I think works relatively well, but I did feel like it got tired. And I will also say that all these games that I just mentioned would not exist in my own collection because they just don't quite make the cut. So maybe they deserve to be here. One game that I want to mention here, it's ranked at 17,091. This is Top Gun Strategy Game. How could anyone (laughs) with the release of Maverick, maybe this one will be shooting up higher, um, but I seriously doubt it. I don't know why it's so low. I think the production here makes it kind of get laughed at, but it's not a a horrible game. There's a volleyball phase. That's already (laughs) kind of funny right there. But during this volleyball phase that lets you, uh, I think, draft cards or decide who's going to go first or second. But you pick up these tokens during that phase. And then you get to apply those during the dogfight phase, which is over this desert landscape. It's just mono e mono. These two planes are going at it in these kind of synth punk colors over this synth punk desert. You have different elevations. There's a lot to these dogfights. You have different elevations and you have different ways you can turn and then different ways you can fire. So it's kind of neat. Yeah, it's a bit tongue in cheek, I guess. And that looks like you can get this game for 13 bucks, which I think the production, this has to be a loss leader because this thing costs more than 13 bucks in ink (laughs) to make. Look at all this pink ink on this thing. It's by Prospero Hall released in 2020. And it used to be available at Target. I don't know if they've cleared it off their shelves by now, but I have this one ranked as six, played it with my dad before. And it was kind of fun. You know, it's the volleyball thing is is just silly. But the dogfight thing wasn't bad. <laughs> uh, let me read a couple of reviews on Board Game Geek on this. And these were both fours. Okay. The, the first one said, only worth playing for the volleyball. And the second <laughs> one said, when the volleyball outshines a dog fighting, you know you're in trouble. And the classic rule of thumb applies. If the word strategy appears in the title, it isn't a strategy game. <laughs> so, oh. so that probably hits how most people were going in hoping for a Top Gun, uh, you know, war strategy game and got a volleyball <laughs> card game i'm surprised there hasn't been a top gun ip but maybe there is i'm I'll, i'm gonna search after the show and see what i can dig up as far as top gun games go yeah it's so sad that target had to wipe this from the shelves to make room for the next 20 expansions for disney villainous That's disney right. villainous yeah so i had a couple of quick mentions Uh, One of them is actually a game that we've reviewed. It sits at number 3086, and it's Godspeed by Clayton Hargrave and Adam Hill and published by Pandasaurus Games, which had solid gameplay, really nice production, nice art, and I think probably one of the most interesting stories of any game that I've ever played. The whole idea there being that the space race was a lie, and we actually weren't trying to get people to the moon, but we'd found a wormhole that brought, you know, Americans and Russians and and folks to, you know, this planet on the other side of the universe trying to colonize it. Super, super interesting and, and a really fun game, too. 
The other thing that I did was just out of curiosity, I looked up what is the lowest ranked game on BGG. And can you guys guess what that might be? Oh, is it poor Monopoly? No, but that's a good guess. Nope, no idea. All right. Well, coming in at a deliriously low 24,035 with a overall cumulative rating of 2.7 is Tick Tac Toe. <laughs> well, it is a pretty bad game. Which needs no explanation because, of course, this game is horrible. I just thought that was funny. But, um, yeah, apparently that is the lowest ranked game in the history of gaming in the world. I don't know. That game gets a bad rap, but it's a great gateway game. What game? It's one of the first games every kid learns how to play at the playground. You have to think ahead a little bit. And then, you know, after you've played it. That game does not have a lot of replay (laughs) value in it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Replay value goes down pretty quickly. (laughs) <laughs> but you get your foot in the door with some tic-tac-toe and you're off and running. Although I will admit, for all that trash talk, the first thing my son does whenever we go to a restaurant, if they give him a kid's menu, is he flips it over, grabs one of the crayons and says, Dad, let's play tic-tac-toe. So I don't know. <laughs> what, what can I say about that? Chris, who wins every one of those games? He does, of course. Nobody does, right? Because it's a tie. <laughs> oh, oh is this supposed to be? Oh, yeah, nobody. Totally nobody. <laughs> nobody ever does. Yeah. No, I was joking before. Chris, that explains your Gaia project last uh, time, yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that will wrap up this episode of Board Game Hot Takes. If you enjoy the show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, the Golden Geek nominations for Best Board Game Podcast should be coming up soon. I've been talking about it for months, but for some reason, they're not here yet. But I think later this month, we're going we're gonna to see those. So, Board Game Geek, Golden Geek rankings, we would love your nomination. Until next week, take care, everybody. Good night, all. Bye-bye.